Ahoy hoy, I'm Planet Walk, and just over a week ago, myself and Seek Truth Speak Truth had a debate with Nathan Thompson and Jeffrey, I'm not even going to bother trying to pronounce his last name because I always get it wrong. And for the most part in that debate, I think I did alright. However, there was one part that I did absolutely terribly on. This is when we were talking about Coriolis. There were a few concepts that I'd gotten mixed up in my head, so I ended up getting a few things wrong. So this video will be addressing Nathan's claim in the Coriolis section of the debate that we had. Unfortunately, this does mean that I'm going to have to play a few clips from the debate that we had. So yes, you will have to put up with Nathan's voice. Got it. We live on a globe. Does it rotate or not? Uh, yes, it does. Excellent. How fast does it rotate at the equator? It rotates at 15 degrees per hour. And in miles Thanks, per hour, how fast is that? Who cares? Oh, who cares? I care because a uh, thousand miles an hour is relatively fast. Now, does the atmosphere move with the Earth or does it move Ooh, separately? From big Earth, numbers. Creating what's called a Coriolis effect. And yes, that's the speed of a bullet. That is a big number. It's quite fast. So ignoring the fact that the 1000 miles per hour figure that he's just throwing out there is completely irrelevant to his point. Yes, there is a Coriolis effect. When it comes to long range artillery shots, they have to account for Coriolis. And the Utvush effect is a side effect of Coriolis. And also, Professor Asher Shapiro has managed to demonstrate the Coriolis effect using a large tub of water that had been resting for about 24 hours. And Shapiro's experiment has been replicated on YouTube by Veritasium. But let's see what Nathan has to say about Coriolis after I explained what it is. And he agreed. So when the hot air balloon goes in the second reference frame, right? It's no longer on the Earth. It would move separately from the Earth, right, Planner Walk? It uh, would. It's would yes be, or no. Okay, so first off, when it comes to a hot air balloon, that would be subject to um, subject to atmosphere. So things like wind. So you probably wouldn't. Uh, hot Coriolis. Get, uh, the Coriolis effect on the hot air balloon would be minimal. minimal. The hot air balloon oh, doesn't really? go that high up in the atmosphere for it to have um, an effect on the hot air balloon. So that was a very bad example by Nathan Thompson because a hot air balloon would be affected by wind a lot and wouldn't even get high enough for Coriolis to have a significant impact. But he does choose another example. The Red Bull space jump went up 228,000 feet. It ascended for three hours and landed back in New Mexico. So you're going to tell me that that Earth rotated under the Red Bull space jump, Planner Walk? Uh, so firstly, how high do you have to go uh, to rotate under you? Because Neil deGrasse Tyson said it rotates under footballs. At ha well, you first I'm off, you'd have to uh, do some calculations. Do, do you have any calculations of how far it should have moved? I don't think it should move. I don't think the Earth rotates. This is your argument. You're supposed to have some kind of data for it. Now you're going to reverse the burden of proof and ask me to prove that the Earth is rotating, Planner Walk? Come on, buddy. Come on. You're going to have to so, do better than that. So firstly, you'd firstly, I haven't done these calculations, and I can't do the like back of envelope back of envelope calculations would take a while uh, for us to do. So one thing that I need to point out here is. Nathan should have done the calculations himself because it is his point. If you bring up a point and there could be some kind of calculations involved, do the calculations yourself. There are two reasons for this. The first is that if your point is correct, then calculations will generally only help your point. The second reason is that if the calculations don't support your point, then it stops some asshole like me from coming along and doing the calculations and showing everyone how much of an idiot you are. So yes, I've done the calculations myself and I have figured out approximately how much of an effect the Coriolis force should have had on the Red Bull space jump. Now because the calculations are actually rather simple, I'm going to go through the calculations and explain how I arrived at the answers. And I actually got three different answers because I went through different levels of complexity. So the first level of complexity is very, very simple. Anyone should be able to do this, including Nathan. Okay, maybe not Nathan, but most other people should be able to do this. So all you have to do for this one is figure out 
how fast Earth should be rotating in comparison to the capsule that Felix was in, then multiply it by how long he was up in the air for. So firstly, we need the circumference of Earth, which is simply the radius of Earth times 2 times pi. Simple. Now next we need to add the height of the capsule to the radius of the Earth and figure out what circumference should a circle have if it had that radius. Once again, 2 our pi, remember that because we're going to be using it time and time again throughout this video. Then with the two circumferences that you've calculated, you've got to minus one off the other. Doesn't really matter which, just whether you want a positive number or a negative number. I like positive numbers, so I minus the smaller one off of the bigger one. Now all you have to do is divide that by 23.934, which is the amount of hours it takes Earth to do one rotation. But planar walk, I hear you say. Doesn't the Earth do one rotation per day, which is 24 hours, so shouldn't we just use 24 rather than 23.934? Now, you can use 24 hours if you want. I prefer to use 23.934 because that is the amount of hours in a sidereal day, which is how long the Earth takes to complete one rotation. 24 hours is how long it takes the Earth to do one rotation in relation to the Sun, which is actually slightly more than one rotation. So now that you've got that number, all you have to do is multiply it by the amount of time that Felix was up in the air for, which was approximately 167 minutes. And with that, we get a result of 28.5 kilometers, a result that would no doubt make flat earthers go, well, huh, why didn't it move 28.5 kilometers to the west? Which I will get to later. But the problem with 28.5 kilometers is that it's horribly inaccurate. It doesn't take into account a whole lot of other factors that would be acting upon it, like the amount of time that it takes to get up to that height, and the amount of time that he's falling for, and also the latitude that it was done at. You see, the jump wasn't done over the equator, and one of the assumptions that I made with those calculations is that it was done directly over the equator. Instead, it was actually done at a latitude of 33.31 degrees north. So obviously, this needs to be taken into account, which is where the second layer of complexity comes in. So rather than just using the standard radius of Earth of 6,371 kilometers, we have to use the radius of that particular latitude, which will involve some trigonometry. Now one of the great things here is that the latitude is actually an angle, and we can use that angle to calculate a cosine which will give us our r value. So all it is is the cosine of 33.3109 times 6371. Oh, and keep in mind that you may have to convert 33.3109 from degrees to radians because some calculators only work in radians. You can do that by dividing by 180 and timesing the result by pi. Now we also have to do the same thing for the height of the capsule. The reason being is because the height of the capsule wasn't 90 degrees to the axis of rotation. So it's the same trigonometry, just instead of timesing it by 6,371 kilometers, you times it by 38.969 kilometers. Now what you do is you essentially replace the radius of the Earth with the new R value that you got, and you replace the height that you had with the new height value that you've got. And with that, we do all the calculations that we did last time, but using the new numbers. So I hope you remember 2R pi. And we do get a significant change in the results that we get. We go from 28.5 kilometers to 23.8 kilometers. So that has changed things quite a bit. However, there is a third level of complexity, which is far more accurate and does involve a fair bit of research. Because in my research, I found that Felix was only at the height of 39 kilometers for about 19 minutes, not the full 167 minutes. The rest of the time, he was ascending and descending, which will impact the amount of Coriolis effect that he is subjected to. So for this, I had to work out the amount of Coriolis force that he was subjected to during the ascent and descent, and how much he was subjected to when he was at his maximum altitude. And I did this on a per second basis for the ascent and descent. 
Now obviously I didn't do this all by hand, in fact I've done none of the calculations in this video by hand. I've been using C Sharp the entire time. This is why I haven't been telling you every result that you should get from every different calculation that you do. Well, that and I don't want to make this video too long either. Alright, so there are a few things that we are going to have to note here. The ascent for Felix took approximately 138 minutes. Then he stated that altitude for approximately 19 minutes before descending for 550 seconds. So one thing that I'm going to assume here is that the ascent and descent were both at linear velocities. I know that neither of them were, but I'm going to assume that because it was very, very difficult to find any kind of concrete ascent data. Now it was actually very easy to find descent data, but I'm going to ignore it. The reason being is because although there is a lot of variation in velocity during the descent, it was also rather short. So the variation in velocity from the descent should actually decrease the amount of Coriolis that Felix was subjected to. However, the variation in velocity from the ascent would increase the amount of Coriolis that he is subjected to. So I'm going to treat them as though they cancel each other out. Although if I had more data, I would have gone ahead and made these calculations more accurate with a fourth level of complexity. But for now, we're stuck with three levels of complexity. So all I did for this level of complexity is I actually just calculated the height that Felix should be at at each second given a linear velocity, which is fairly easy, especially with a loop. For the ascent, it was the point in time that it was calculating for for the ascent divided by the total amount of time it took to ascend, times the height that it reached. And with the height that I received, I just threw it into the calculations that we got earlier, and instead of calculating for 167 minutes, I calculated for one second. Now with the descent, I did pretty much the same thing as the ascent, however, I was counting downwards for the point in time instead of counting upwards. Now this is my code for anyone that wants to take a look and tell me if I got anything wrong, or maybe they want to improve on it. One of the things that I will note about my code is that I was using units such as meters, not kilometers, and I was using seconds instead of minutes and hours. Also, don't question why there's a whole lot of doubles everywhere instead of using floats or integers. Now the results that I got from that bit of code that you just saw was 13.2 kilometers. So we've gone from 28.5 kilometers down to 23.8 kilometers down to 13.2 kilometers. See, trying to be accurate pays off. Now keeping that 13.2 kilometer difference in mind, let's have a little listen to Nathan's statement again. The Red Bull space jump went up 228,000 feet. It ascended for three hours and landed back in New Mexico. So you're going to tell me that that Earth rotated under the Red Bull space jump? Planner walk. So I don't know if Nathan knows his geography that well, but New Mexico is larger than 13 kilometers across. Except that doesn't matter, does it? Because there is actually something else that we have to consider. So Felix landed 70 kilometers east of where he took off from completely nullifying any point made about Coriolis effect on the Red Bull space jump. Because regardless of whether you think the Earth spins or not, the 13 kilometers west that he would have experienced due to Coriolis is completely overshadowed by the 70 kilometers east that he did land. The 13 kilometers west is only a fifth of 70 kilometers, approximately. And if something can move in 70 kilometers to the east, I'm thinking wind, it's not completely inconceivable that that could move him another 13 kilometers to the east, completely making up for whatever effect Coriolis had on him. Therefore, nullifying Nathan's point completely. So Nathan, if you're watching this video, I've done the maths for you. Sure, it is in kilometers, not miles, but you know, it should be fairly easy to convert kilometers to miles. Just as long as you're better than Nathan Oakley at converting meters to kilometers. So if you're watching this video, I hope you never use that argument again because it's stupid. And the math shows that it's stupid. But anyway, that's it for this video. As always, a big shout out to my $20 or more patrons. What Jesus? Hugh Jars, MC Nutkin, Wolfie and Mori. If you want to support me financially, you can do so on Patreon. There should be a link there. But anyway, I will see you in the next video. Between you and me, thank you for watching. Uh, so firstly, How long have you been studying this? Why aren't you satisfied?
Why don't you want to do your own research? A better question is, why hasn't Nathan?